Well, today's a, a day that we recognize globally where people take the time out to specifically and intentionally acknowledge their moms and uh, honor them. And whilst, yes, we, we do want to do that on a daily basis, but today is a little bit special. Let me also say that there's no scripture that I can give you that says we must have Mother's Day. <laughs> okay? So just relax. I, I think it's a good thing to honor mothers. The title of the message today is Mothers, Unsung and Hidden Heroes. Mothers, Unsung, Hidden Heroes. And I do want to say to all the moms that uh, we wish you a very happy Mother's Day. I also want to recognize, and folks, we do want to recognize this this morning, that there are moms amongst us who are single moms. And they face a lot of challenges being a single mom for whatever reason. And it's tough on them sometimes. And sometimes it's very challenging. I remember when Faye and I had our first child, Lanelle, and she got sick one time. And uh, through the course of the night, uh, we had to look after her, watching her. So I would look after Lanelle and for a few hours, and then Faye would take over from me, and then I would take over from her, and then the night would be gone, and we'd be ready for work. And, and that happened over like two or three days. And I remember Faye and I looking at each other, and we said, how do single moms cope? She still had me to say, honey, I'm going to sleep. Can you keep looking after Lanel? I had her. And so today, as we honor mothers, we also want to mention our single moms for whatever reason. And some moms are single not because <laughs> there's no dad, but because dad chooses to be absent. He chooses to be uninvolved. So we do want to recognize them. We also want to recognize those moms, uh, those ladies amongst us who have wanted to be moms. But due to biology, they just are not able to conceive. And we recognize the pain and the hardship they go through. In fact, we have a friend who's always wanted to have children, but she can't. And yet in her family, there's a young member of the family who's had a baby. And is, she's, not, she's really too young to have had the baby. She's not mature enough. And... This dear friend of ours, her heart breaks because she looks and there she sees, I want to be a mom. <laughs> I know how to be a mom. And this young lady who is a mom, and she almost wants to shout out to God, it's not fair. And, and, but she's more mature than that. And uh, she goes through the heartache of that kind of stuff. So we want to recognize and honor them. And then we also want to remember the moms who've passed on. The moms who have left a legacy in the life of their children and their families. They've passed on, but when we look at them, you can say, you can see that so-and-so's daughter. You can see that so-and-so's son. She raised them well. She did a good job. And so today, for you, maybe you're sitting here and, you think, and, you, and your mom has passed on, but you remember her. That's good. Honor your mom. Honor the memory of your mom and the legacy that she's left behind. And so, of course, on a day like today, why should we not talk about some of the things that moms face? And courtesy of the internet, I got a couple of little stories and I found them very interesting. Uh, little Billy goes into the room and he sees his mother sitting there and she's rubbing moisturizing cream on her face. And so little Billy says, hey mom, what are you doing? She says, oh, I'm rubbing this cold cream on my face. She has moisturizing cream on my face. He says, why are you doing that? She says, well, so that I can have a lovely skin. And Billy watches her, and then a few seconds later, mom starts wiping off the cream. He says, mom, why are you giving up so soon? <laughs> a mother told her daughter, she said, listen, my darling, you can cook a man a fish and you'll feed him for a day. But if you teach him how to fish, you can get rid of him for the whole weekend. <laughs> I knew someone would like that. <laughs> there was a police recruit. <laughs> And uh, he was doing his exam. And one of the questions in the exam was, what would you do if you had to arrest your mother? He said, I'll call for backup. <laughs> oh, Our mothers have taught us a lot of things. You know, my mother taught me religion. Because when I spilled the grape juice on the carpet, she instructed and said to me, you better pray that the stain comes out. My mother taught me logic from her decisive words. Because I said so, that's why. My mother taught me foresight. You better make sure you wear clean underwear in case you're in an accident. <laughs> 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 I 
I laugh, you know why? Because we, we have an aunt, <laughs> a lovely woman. She's passed on to be with the Lord. I think she's watching me right now and thinking, don't you dare, you little scallywag. But she would say, oops, if I go into town today, I hope I don't have an accident because I don't have any underwear on. I mean, <laughs> she, she was an amazing, lovely woman. So, you know, mothers teach us a lot. My mother taught me irony. My mother taught me irony. Keep laughing and I'll give you something to cry about. <laughs> My mother taught me stamina. You sit there until all your spinach is finished. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. My mother taught me about the weather. It looks as if a tornado came through your room. Oh, yeah. And I know there's some mothers who've taught this lesson about the circle of life. My mother taught me about the circle of life. I brought you into this world and I can take you out. <laughs> <laughs> you. My mother also taught me about behavior modification. About behavior modification. Stop acting like your father. <laughs> and finally, my mother taught me about envy. There's a million, there are millions of less fortunate children in the world who do not have a wonderful mother like you do. Mm. You know, God could not be everywhere. And so that's why he created mothers says an old Jewish proverb. A mother understands what a child does not say, says another Jewish proverb. But listen to this. A man loves his sweetheart the most, his wife the best, but his mother the longest. And finally, by a guy named of Milton Berle, he said this. If evolution really works, if evolution really works, how come mothers only have two arms? Mm. Two arms. I remember there's a friend of mine, he's also gone to be with the Lord. And uh, they, he, he, they would come to church, and his wife would be getting out with the kids. And she's got a bag here, and a this here, and she's trying to hold the kids' arms, and this. And he's walking in. <laughs> you know? And you know, she's like trying to be a little octopus carrying all of these things together. You know, and whilst we might laugh at these things, and these anecdotes, and little stories and proverbs. I think during this lockdown period, the one demographic that has really taken a hit is our ladies, and by default, our mothers. By extension, rather, our mothers. They've taken a knock, because in these difficult times, where things are uncertain, and if there's one thing I've come to understand about the average, there are exceptions to this, ladies, so don't get off on your, on your high horse. But the average woman, the average mother, wants stability and security. And this lockdown period has been anything but stable and secure. We went from you can't go here to maybe you can, to 100 people to 50 people. Then you can't, then you had to wear your mask, then you had to be stopped by the police, then it was okay. Then you, it, it was just crazy. And you've got moms who are looking after the house, looking after the home, looking after the kids, looking after their husband, making sure everything's okay. And I'm not saying that men didn't do anything, but the one group that really got nailed was our mothers. And so today we really do want to honor them. So now, we're going to turn to the Word of God, because that's what we came for. So let's go to Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 to 20. Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 to 20. Now the birth of Jesus Christ happened like this. His mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph and before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man and not willing to make her a public example, intended to put her away secretly. Everybody say secretly. Yeah. But when he thought about these things, look, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to yourself Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit or of the Holy Ghost, depending on the translation that you've got. So here we have a situation, and I'm going to give you some takeaways. There's about four takeaways that we can all benefit as we consider mothers and what they do and how they are. And so here we have a situation where Mary who's engaged to Joseph, it's discovered that she's pregnant. Joseph's reaction is, I don't want to shame her, I don't want to embarrass her, so I'll put her away quietly. And um, just consider the fact that Mary had this very detailed kind of story told to her. 
this is what's going to happen. And lest you think it's like, well, so what's the big deal? An angel appeared. Well, first of all, what would you do if an angel appeared to you? You're sitting by yourself. I mean, literally, an angel appears. I know some of us will faint. Some of us will run away. I spogo and go all over the show. But she's a young girl. She's, she's not a mature person. She's a young girl. She's in her teens. And the angel, the angel comes before and the angel says, yo, God loves you. I got news for you. You're going to have a baby. Hey, eh? what? You're going to have a baby. And this is what you're going to call this baby. So it's pretty detailed and the shock value. And so Mary listens to that. Let's quickly go to Luke chapter 1. And we're going to come back to this. Luke chapter 1 verse 26. Luke chapter 1 verse 10. It says, Now the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. Having come in, the angel said to her, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But when she saw him, she was greatly troubled at the saying and considered what kind of salutation this might be. The angel said, now listen, the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. God likes you. And look, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and call his name Jesus. He will be great and he will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. There will be no end to his kingdom. Mary said to the angel, how can this be, seeing as I am a virgin? The angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High God will overshadow you. Therefore also the Holy One who is born will be called the Son of God. And look, Elizabeth, your relative, also has conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month with her, who is called barren. For with God, nothing will be impossible. Verse 38, and Mary said, see the handmaiden of the Lord. See me, the servant of the Lord. Be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Be it unto me, as some translation says, according to your word. So we're going to look at some takeaways from this. From those two scriptures. The first takeaway is that God will and can use a woman. Now, you might say, as ah, obvious. It's not to all of us because some people do not believe that. Some people think that God always speaks to men and not necessarily to women. And so, the first takeaway is that God can and will use women. Now, gentlemen, I want you to let this just sink into your thinkery for a moment. Joseph had absolutely nothing to do with what was in Mary's womb. Just let that sink for a minute. Joseph had absolutely nothing to do with that. Absolutely nothing. Nothing whatsoever. Now let me also say this, and ladies, you need to hear this. Whilst the angel of the Lord came and told Mary that this is going to happen, the angel of the Lord did not say to Mary, and you don't need Joseph. She didn't say that. The angel didn't say that. You don't need Joseph. So before we get on our high hobbies, I don't need a man in my life. Yo, settle down. <laughs> settle down. Back it up a little bit. Just tone down the emotion. Let's get something straight, okay? So... The angel said some things and didn't say some other things. So the angel says to Mary, this, uh, this is going to happen. Joseph wants to put her away. So the first thing is that God can and will use a woman. And let me say this again to the gentleman. If God wants to use your wife, he doesn't have to ask for your permission. Let me just say that again. If God wants to use your wife for his agenda... He doesn't ask you necessarily for your permission. He doesn't come up to you and say, Yo, bro, I'd like to use your wife. Is that okay with you? Because by the way, gentlemen, your wife is not your property. Hello? You know, we watch these Indian movies. Do you ever watch Indian movies on, on uh, Open View TV? I know some of you say, oh, oh, why did he bring that up? We watch them and, then, and there's a couple of these. But in some of them, they show the man as being, for the woman, the wife, he must, she must regard him as the Almighty, as God. And whatever he says, he can never be wrong. 
and they don't count. Whatever husband says, that's what they want. If the husband says, you want to wear green clothes, yes, I want to wear green clothes, even if she wants to wear purple. Now, I'm not, I'm not anti the Indians just for a minute, so just... I'm talking about the illustration where the woman is illustrated as being subservient, second-rate, absolutely nothing. And there are communities where that has gone. For years and for generations, women have had to be, we've had, they've had, somebody had to stand out for them and protect them. Somebody's had to say, no, let's give these women respect. Women weren't allowed to vote at one time just because they were women. And so Joseph, he wants to put her away. Isn't that what so many of the men folk like to do? Hey, those women just like to talk, talk, talk. I wish she'd just shut up. Just stay at home. Cook food. Clean the house. Isn't it? Now that came from Joseph. Joseph was like, I'll put it away. Now, I, I, hesitate, I hasten to add that I know the Bible doesn't say this. I'm taking a little bit of liberty. Okay? Maybe the reason Joseph wanted to put her away was, yes, for her shame in, in terms of the community, that she would be shamed and she would be frowned upon. But I think there was also some personal agenda there. You know, hey, bro, your, your chick's pregnant, but it's not yours, huh? <laughs> so I think maybe Joseph was a little bit, you know, like, ish. When people find out she's going to have a baby and it's not me, hey, bro, what's been happening, you know? You still want to marry this chick? And so he wanted to put her away. And so, a mother needs to be heard, embraced, and she needs to be allowed to have her say. And I say, that, I say mothers, but really I'm talking about women, because only women can become mothers. Am I right? Only women can become mothers. We'll talk about that later. So now let's go on. Mary's given us a description of what's going to happen. And look at her response. So here's another takeaway we get from Mary. Two wonderful Christian virtues that Mary would teach us, that mothers teach us. Humility and submission. She says, I'm the servant of the Lord. Be it unto me, as according to your word. And how many of us know about women who are so self-sacrificial, mothers who sacrifice? I, I remember my mom, many, many years ago when I was uh, a little boy, and uh, I overheard my mom and my dad talking. And uh, my mom said to my dad, let the kids eat first, and then we'll share what's ever left over. They didn't know I was listening, because the family was going through a bit of a tough time at that time. And I know Faye and I have had those times in our life where things were going a bit tough, and... Uh, we didn't have a lot of stuff, and we didn't have a lot of food. And, and Faye and I have had those times where I said, Honey, let the, we'll let the kids eat first, and then we'll eat what's left. And, that's what mother, and, and, and oftentimes, that's what a mother does. So Mary exhibits humility. She says, I'm a servant. I'm here to serve. Yesterday, we had a, 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 a leaders' meeting. And uh, one of the things that I did was I had a scan through the document that uh, some of us were given. And I looked under the tea ministry. You know the people that serve tea when we used to serve tea? I looked under that, on that list. And I think there were two male names out of about 20, I think it was. All of them, all women. Somewhere in our psyche, we've gotten as men to believe that it's not our place to go and stand and serve. That's what women do. They serve behind the table, giving us tea and cookies and smiling nice for us. Now, I'm not anti-men, so guys, listen, I'm not anti-men. I'm just saying that it seems like maybe we need to recognize. It's almost like women come naturally into this thing this of serving. It's, it, it seems that way. They, 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 they do it almost without thinking. And I want to encourage the men, maybe... As time goes on and when we start opening up the doors and we start having tea, that actually we get behind them and we say, ladies, we'll, we'll, we'll take over. You're going to have a rest. How many men do you know that are teaching in the children's church? Mm. Ah, it's just for the women. The women teach. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying women can't teach. I am just saying that they're willing to serve. But it does seem that a lot of us as men have this mindset 
that we are to be served and we would do well to learn from mothers the idea of serving in humility, of putting someone else ahead of us. Eh? Is that okay? If it's not okay, too bad. That's what it is. The second lesson, of course, was let it be according to me, which is submission. We're living in a time where people don't... On, 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 on every morning of the week, one of my duties is to be part of the sanitizing and temperature testing team, and one of the responsibilities I've taken on myself is to direct traffic in our car park. Hallelujah. Have you ever tried to direct parents on a Monday morning in a car park that is pretty congested and you're trying to make sure everybody gets out with bump, without bumping anyone? This idea of submission, I'll tell you this much. Generally speaking, when the ladies move and they drive their cars and I do like this, to stop, they do. But there's quite a few, and it's yes, it's men. They come racing it, and I'm saying, hey, slow down. And I've got to jump out of the way. Because it's like, who do you think you are to tell me to slow down? What you put your hand up? You haven't got a yellow jacket on. You're not even a policeman. You know, that's the mindset oftentimes of men, but not only of men, humanity as a whole. And we can learn this lesson from a mother. Mary said, let it be. And listen, by the way, what is she saying? Let it be. She's a teenage girl. She's not yet married. When she's found to be pregnant, she's going to face stigma. She's going to face some ridicule. She's going to face some shame. And she's saying, it's, if that's what I have to do for the Lord, okay. Wow. She's willing to face that. You and I need, would do well to be willing to submit to God's plan for us. Even if it means we face ridicule. Even if it means we face some kind of censure. Even if it means we face some kind of, huh? Yeah, a bit weird. Because sometimes we are perceived as being a little bit on the strange side. Because we choose to forgive rather than take revenge. We choose to love rather than to hate. We choose to put others first rather than exalt ourselves. We choose to do that as God's people. And so we find ourselves in that position. Solomon, in Proverbs chapter 1, verse 8 and 9, he says, Hear, my son, your father's instruction. So dads, we're in this deal. But listen to this. But forsake not your mother's teaching, for they are a graceful garland for your head and pendants for your neck. Her teachings are an adornment. Her teachings are something to be seen. Um, I know that, you know, have you heard this thing called bling? Where do you put bling? On the inside or the outside? On the outside. Because you want people to see it. Check me out. You know, I'm looking cool. I've got a gold chain and i got this and i got that. And what a mother, so the takeaway is the mother's teachings, the thing that she's taught, one by her words, two by her example, wear them. Show them to the world. I learned this from my mom. My mom taught me this. And don't be ashamed of it. And, and I'm speaking again to the men, all of us, but again to the men. It doesn't mean you're a mommy's boy. If your mom taught you some stuff, be glad you learned some stuff. <laughs> and if somebody has to call your mommy's boy, okay, they in deception, but it's their choice. It's their problem. John chapter 2. Verses 1 to 5, we read about the marriage feast, the marriage in Cana of Galilee, right? You can go there. The story, they're at this wedding, Jesus is there, the wine runs out, and in the community that time, if the wine ran out, it was a very bad thing, it was, people would be embarrassed, and it would be all terrible and wonderful, and it'd be like, ah, the wine's not there, how can you have a function, and people would make fun of them and all that. So Mary is the one that finds out that the wine's run out. She comes across to her son, Jesus, and says to him, the wine has run out. Now, have you ever, you know that your mom tells you something, but she's actually asking you to do something. She gives you information, but actually there's a question. She doesn't pose the question, but she gives you information. And that's what moms do. Uh, I know some of the men, your wife will tell you something. She'll say something to you. She's not just telling you something. She's actually saying, yo, brah, can you, <laughs> there's something. She'll say, my car's making a funny noise. That's not information sharing. 
<laughs> That's, can you look at my car? <laughs> you know? And so Mary does this. What does Jesus say? Jesus says, it's not my time yet. Sounds like a bit of a rebuff, hey? Sounds like, hey, ma, not yet, huh? It's not my time. And what does Mary do? And I love this. She toddles off to the workers and she says, whatever he says, just do it. Whatever he says, just She knew her son so well. You know, our mothers know us so well. They know what we're going to do. And she knew. She took a step of faith, moved by compassion. And that's the takeaway. The takeaway is when we see a need, let's be moved by compassion to take a step of active faith to minister to that need. That's an amazing takeaway. That's an amazing lesson. And you know what? Mary does it. And I mean, I don't know what those guys were thinking when, when she said to them, whatever. I mean, because remember, she says, whatever. Whatever he says, just do it. Not if he tells you to put water in pots, do it. Just whatever. Just be obedient. Whatever he says to you, because I know my son. He's not going to tell you nonsense. And whatever he says to you, you just do it. And then you know the rest of the story. So the invitation to you this morning is, let's take on these takeaways that God can use women, that we need to be humble, we need to be compassionate, we need to be submitted to the Lord. Wonderful takeaways. And you know what? Just like Joseph wanted to put Mary away, and this is where the, the message starts to get hairy, so brace yourselves. Just kind of sit up straight in your chair and just, it's going to get a bit hairy right now. I don't know why I say hairy, but it's going to get scary. Our mothers are indeed oftentimes hidden and the unsung heroes. But I want to say to you today, as I close this message, and that's what I'm walking to right now, I'm, I'm moving towards the close of the message. I want to issue a call to arms on behalf of our women, on behalf of our mothers. Because there is a movement to annihilate them. There is a movement to annihilate and destroy motherhood. Do you know that right now there's a trend? We don't want to call mothers mothers. We call them uh, child-bearing persons. We don't want to call them mothers. We call them child-bearing persons. Now, I'm going to talk for a few minutes about the whole transgender movement because it pains me. It, it, it's one of those things that I, I just, you know, it's because I see the destruction of women. I see the destruction of motherhood by this movement. By this movement that says, no, we don't want to have this. And, and you can listen, listen, listen to their definition of gender identity. This is the definition. This is how they see gender identity. Our gender identity is how we feel in relation to being male or female. And there are different terms descriptions and labels of different types for different types of gender identities. But listen to that first statement, that first bit. Our gender identity is how we feel about being male or female. There's no biology. There's no scientific fact. It's about how we feel. Which means, please me to say this, if I wake up in the morning and I feel like a monkey, does that make me a monkey? And what makes me so angry about this movement is that they ask us to be as stupid as the movement is. Because what the movement is saying is, if I feel, although I'm a man, if I feel like I'm a woman, you've got to agree with me. Eh? I've got to agree with you in your delusion. Now, I know that this is a, it's, it's, it's an emotional issue for some people, I don't hate the people that are transgender. I hate what the movement is doing to mothers and women. Did you know that Facebook recognizes about 58 genders? Now, they won't tell you what they are. They won't say, yes, we've got 58 genders. But ABC did some research, and they came up with 58. Okay, I'm not going to read all of them, but I'll just give you a few. Your gender identity can be a gender. That means you don't have one. Hello? That means you can sit down and say, you know what? I feel like I don't have a gender. So I don't have one. 
And everybody's got to agree with you that you don't have a gender. By gender, you got both. Cisgender, cis female, cis male, cis man. I don't know about that word cis. As a kid growing up, cis wasn't a nice word. It's like, ah, cis man. I don't know about you. Was cis a nice word? Ah, cis. Hey. There's 58 of them trans female, trans male, trans man, transgender female, transgender male. And the list goes on to two spirit. You can be a gender called two spirit. What does that mean? Now, I'm raising this in the context on a Mother's Day because I see an attack on mothers. We're trying to get rid of them. We're trying to get rid of women because that's actually what's going to happen. And the, the people driving this are men, a lot of them, who want to be considered women. And if you perhaps call the guy sir, you get into a, a feisty battle because how can you misgender me? How can you... Hey, ba, you got a beard. Although as I say that, I know there are some women that have. <laughs> so it could be a bit of a dodgy one, eh? I remember seeing this Portuguese auntie, a granny, and she, yeah, anyway, let's not go there. <laughs> I worked in, Amer in, in Namibia for 10 years, and one of, during the time that I was there, I met a, a guy, married, lovely wife, uh, he's a dad, he's a father. They returned to the States, and shortly after they returned to the States, after their stint in Namibia, he spoke to his wife, and he called his wife, and he said to her, you know, all my life, I felt... I should have been a woman. So I'm going to live the rest of my life as a transgender woman. And we can stay together. And she said to him, as what? As what? Because we've been husband and wife, but what are you now? If, if you're going to be a transgender woman, does that make me a lesbian? You hear me? Can, 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 can you, so you asking me, these people are asking us to agree with this misconception based on nothing but feelings. Based on nothing but feelings. How you feel. So maybe one day I'll just go to State House and say, I feel like I'm the president. <laughs> I just know all my life I was meant to be the president. I just feel it in my bones. What about if someone comes to the revival center and says, I just feel like I'm the pastor of this church. You know, I just know God spoke to me and I must be the pastor of the church. We say, hey, Buddha, we'll sign up for counseling. <laughs> we have a pastor. His name is Wayne. What's your name? Johnson. Sorry, Johnson. <laughs> so people, this movement is happening. It's driven by people who say we feel a certain way. We now have transgender women in sport, now let me just be blunt. A transgender woman is a man. Let me be blunt. A transgender woman is a man who thinks he should have been a woman. That's it. Caitlyn Jenner won Olympic medals as Bruce Jenner. Yeah. Caitlyn Jenner is a man who looks like a woman, who tries to act like a woman, but is a man. That's not hate speech. It's truth and fact. It's not hate speech. And let me just say this. If you go to the doctor and you're grossly overweight, and the doctor says you're overweight, it's not hate speech. It's health advice. You're overweight and you need to do something about it, because if you don't, you're going to die prematurely. Hello? If you're a businessman and your business is floundering and a friend of yours looks at the way you do business and says, you know, bro, this is the problem with your business. That's not hate speech. That's help speech. Trying to help you fix up. 
And so we've got this movement that's happening. And you can say to me, oh, Eric, it's not a problem. You know, it's happening in America. Let me ask you a question. It's happening in America. It's happening in the UK. Where do we get our syllabus for ONA level from? And what happens if they throw into the syllabus in the study of biology or life skills? Or, uh, this thing about gender fluidity. I was listening to one of the guys in a, in, a, in, a, in a talk show, and there was a young woman that asked him some questions, and finally he said to her, on the transgender movement and self-identification movement, and, she, and he asked her a question. He said, how old are you? She says, I'm 35. He says, why aren't you 60? Why aren't you 60? Why don't you identify as 60? There's perks in being 60. You go to the front of the line. You get a special seat on the bus. You get special dispensation when you go to eating places. Pensioners go first. <laughs> you only pay 50% of the bill. Hello, so it would be a nice thing. You know, to identify. Don't you feel old sometimes? Just identify as 60. She says, but I'm not 60. He says, that's right, and you're not a man. It's not malleable. It doesn't interchange just based on your feelings. And by the way, that's what I'm, I want to drive home. It's driven by how I feel. I got news for you. Facts don't lie. When I wake up in the morning, I sometimes feel like I don't want to go to work. The fact is, if I don't go to work, I'm going to get into trouble. Hello? There's a police roadblock on Esigodini Road. Sometimes I don't feel like stopping. <laughs> I just don't feel it. What will happen if I don't stop? So I'm driving this home, but understand me, it's against this backdrop of these amazing people we call mothers, women. We, call, we know them. We're supposed to treasure them. We're supposed to value them. We're supposed to look after them. We're supposed to guard them. We're supposed to exalt them. We're supposed to treasure them. That's what we are supposed to do. But these people are coming and saying, they don't count. So now they want to have athletics and Soccer and mixed martial arts and sport in general, where a man who thinks and feels he should have been a woman wants to participate in women's sport. Yes, it's happening. And there's legislation going out now that schools got it. And don't be surprised if it doesn't come here. Let's not, it's happening in South Africa. It's happening. And you think your little teenager is not going on to TikTok talk and onto Twitter and onto Facebook and not being exposed to this. Parents, let's get our heads out of the sand. One day your sons may just come home to you and say, guess what? My name is not Eric. My name is Erica from now onwards. <laughs> and then you say like all oh, good mothers, I brought you into this world. And I sure as hell can take you out. You come with that nonsense anymore. <laughs> so there's much that can be said about this. But one of the places where it is, it, it's of concern to me is where transgender women are trying to play in sport. And I watched a video of an athletics meeting. It was the 4 by 100 meters relay. And the transgender person was the last runner. And when that person got the baton to do the last 100 meters, sorry, it was 400 meters, not 100, it was 4 by 400, once around the track. As they took off, most of the other runners were ahead of this person. They were, I think, one or two behind. But the other four or three were ahead of this person. And this person, a man, ran so fast, he passed all of them except the first person because that lady, her team had given her a nice lead and he couldn't make it, but he came second. All the others couldn't make it because they ran within, they couldn't. But this guy, because of his, as a man, and that's supposed to be fair, that's supposed to be right. Just happening to women's sport, it's going out the door. Can you imagine LeBron James waking up one day and saying, I'm not LeBron anymore, I'm LeBria. And deciding he's going to play basketball in the women's NBA. I give you these examples because you've got to start thinking. What do you think is going to happen in that women's NBA? 
So I give you this because we must protect our women. Now let me take you to the word of God. Because you need to have this as your foundation. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 onwards to verse 28. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them. Notice, it says, let, me make man, let us make man in our own image after our likeness and let them. Not let him, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. And God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Then it says, male and female created he them. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. That's God's word. And right there it says, God said, male and female, there's only two. Now let me hasten to add, there are cases where a child is born with both feminine or female and male genitalia and organs. That does happen, okay? But that is the exception, not the rule. And that has to be treated, not exalted as this is the way it should be. And so, God's word clearly says there's two, male, female. And gender is not malleable. Gender cannot just be fluid and change. So today I'm a guy, tomorrow I'm a girl. When it suits me, I'm a guy. When it suits me, I'm a girl. What am I saying to you and to me this morning? We need to guard and keep and protect our women folk. And womanhood. Because it's under assault. To think that a mother is no longer called a mother. So maybe next year we won't have Mother's Day. We'll have people who birth children. Day. I invite you, I appeal to you, I, in essence, I command you. We owe it to God to rise up and say no. And it's not hate speech. It's not hatred. It's God's standards. Listen, when I go to the doctor and he says to me, you've got a hernia, you need an operation, because that did happen to me. It's not because he hated me. It's not because he's trying to hurt me. It's not because he's trying to make my life a misery. He's actually trying to help me. So when somebody comes and they've got a problem, they've got the idea that they were supposed to be one way when in fact they're another way, we need to help them lovingly. Don't hate people. We were just talking this morning after the first service about a young man in Zimbabwe who felt that he should have been a woman and, and one day he went into a lady's toilet at, an, at a function and he got arrested and he was, he was treated very inhumanely and very poorly. And I remember saying to the person I was speaking with, the worst and best thing happened to him. The worst was the way he was treated. He should never have been treated that way. Never. But it was the best thing for him because he made the headlines and now he lives in the U.S., He's got all the support, he's got advocates behind him, and he's campaigning for LGBTQ rights and the transgender movement. And my question to you is, where will your kids be in 10 years' time if we do nothing? Where will your little girls be in 10 years' time? Where will your little boys be in 10 years' time, 15 years' time, if we do nothing? So on Mother's Day, yes, we honor mothers. We honor our women folk. We honor womanhood. But I have to say... We cannot remain silent in the face of this onslaught. We cannot. There's too much at stake for us to remain silent. So I invite you, gentlemen in particular, we must honor mothers. We must guard, keep, and protect them. Now that doesn't mean that women can't look after themselves. Please don't get me wrong. It's not demeaning and saying women are useless. But God has given us a responsibility to guard and to keep. My little girls are my pride and joy. They tell me they're not so little anymore. But they, they're my little girls. If anyone touches my little girls, they will see the dragon 
of God come out and deal with them. And then don't come and say to me, but you know, you mustn't be so violent. Yo, sissy. <laughs> don't, don't come to me with that pseudo-Christian garbage that we've got to be gentle, meek, and mild. You're touching my child. You're touching my little girl. Who the hell gives you the right to do that? Who? Because God put them under my responsibility, not yours. And if I got to beat you up or die in the process, so be it. Men, we've got to rise up, not because the women in our lives, the women in our church, the women in our communities are incapable, but there's an onslaught and a wave, a tsunami wave coming against them, trying to annihilate their identity. And we need to be the ones who stand up and say no. We need to be the ones that face the, the darts. We need to be the ones that guard and keep them. When they get hurt, we come and make sure that we administer healing and a touch of hope and health to them. That's our job. So I'm speaking to the men. So as we close the service, I want all the men to come and stand in the front here. I want all the men to come and stand in the front here. And if you're over the age of 13, it includes you. I want all the men to come and stand in the front here. Right in the front, right across the front of the aisle. Now for some of you younger men, this will seem crazy and weird. Stick with me. For the most part, seated on those chairs are women folk. Moms, ladies. Our, our women folk, whom God has entrusted as part of this fellowship. And you gentlemen are going to join me in a very simple act. As we pray for our mothers who are seated, and I'm having them seated because it's a seat of honor. That's your throne, ladies. Just visualize for a moment that you're sitting on a throne. And gentlemen, I'm going to invite you to raise your hands as a cover over these women, and we're going to pray for them. Just raise your hands so that they know they are covered. Father in heaven, I thank you for every mother, every woman that sits in this sanctuary. And along with these men, we stand together and we acknowledge that there's an onslaught coming against them. And we take our place. We stand in the gap. We lift our hands and we say, it will not touch them. We will stand to guard, keep, honor, elevate and lift them up. Keep them safe, keep them strong, provide for them. We will do that because we are the men of God that you've called into this fellowship to do this amazing, awesome task and you will be our helper. Father, I pray for every mother. I pray for every woman that sits down right now on that throne as it were. And I ask you, Lord Jesus, to just enfold them to know, let them know that they are special. Let them know that they are privileged. Let them know that they found favor in your eyes. Let them know that they're in a fellowship where the, where the men of God will watch over them, will protect them, will be honest with them, will guard them, will keep them, will make sure that they don't get hurt. And Father, we'll do everything in our power as the men of God to anoint them with love, to anoint them with your words of truth and be Godly men, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. I want to say thank you to all of you men for doing that. God bless you. You may take your seats. And ladies, indeed we honor you. Indeed we exalt you, all of you. In particular the mums who are amongst us. In particular the single mums who are amongst us. And that you know. Let me just say this. If you happen to know a mother who's going through a difficult time, Today, give them a call. Speak to them. Let them know that even though they're going through a difficult time, they are a treasure. They are a gem. And that you love them. And if you have the capacity, if you know that they need a meal, if you know that they need a little something, purpose in your heart to say, I'm coming over to see you at 2 o'clock or 1 o'clock or 3 o'clock. And just go there take a cake or take some donuts or do something, if you can. 
Just go and do that. And bless them. If your mom is not around, tell your children what mommy taught you. And honor her legacy as you do that. But have a great Sunday. Have a great Mother's Day. Enjoy the day. Keep an eye open. And finally, I know I talked about the transgender movement, and you might say to me, Pastor Eric, what's that got to do with me? All of you that are on Facebook, start talking. They might cancel you on Facebook, but I think it's worth getting canceled for righteousness' sake. Maybe we should. And maybe when enough people are standing out there and they keep canceling us, maybe there will be another network, another social media net that comes up, and I think there are some that are coming up. and We can use that. But why not? When we're on the streets and people start talking to, me about, uh, talking to you about gender fluidity, just lovingly say to them, it's not so. You don't have to fight. Just say, it's not so. A quiet word turns away much wrath. Just lovingly say, it's not so. There's two genders. There's two sexes, male and female. As klar, finished. That's it. God bless you. Have a great Sunday, and we'll see you next week. Amen.